Welcome everyone. It's uh, March of 2024 and spring is about here. And so we're uh, welcoming everyone. We've got a good turnout. I don't know what the number is here, but uh, probably 30 people here, I guess. And um, we're excited to have, uh, look forward to Fred's presentation. Um, some quick notes that in the Southern Exposure um, newsletter, they, on page two is a survey, and you might want to look over that and do a reply if you have some input about that. Um, some basic questions were asked there. Is it too expensive, uh, et cetera? And your input, at least from the members of the group, would be very valuable, and uh, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, there were, it's always a nice event, but there were some complaints that it was a bit pricey for some folks, and, um, but we'd like to hear from uh, you, good or bad. Um, many thanks to Mary Fist Taylor, last uh, uh, February's evaluator, 60 attendees, great feedback, and you can check the YouTube channel for CCR if you want to relive that but it was a nice uh, event and we were very grateful to her. <clears throat> Just a, another um, reminder on April 9th is a hybrid meeting. Um, Anthony Rumley uh, is here, who's here tonight as well. And he's gonna say just a couple words after I finish and before Fred. Um, the assigned subject is doors and or windows. And if you can get your images in the earlier, the better, um, but that should be a, a fun meeting with uh, a, a lot of interesting uh, uh, images. Dues, if you've not paid dues, uh, you're overdue now. Um, I hope that everyone in the room has, and we just, um, if, you're, if you're delinquent, then step up and we'd like to see your check and make it better. Uh, from Joe Ring, lots of events coming up. You can look in the newsletter and see, just pay attention. Um, I don't know if this has gotten solved since I printed it up. Uh, Karen, any comment about uh, the Virtual Academy? Um, and did we get enough photographers to solve that? Yes, I did just hear from Marianne today, and she has enough for Friday. I'm not sure about Thursday the 28th. So stand by if you're willing to volunteer, and hopefully she'll be back in touch if she needs somebody. But Friday is covered. So thank you, everybody, for volunteering. Great. Great. Okay. This doesn't go forward. Okay. Um, as of last count, 100 paid members. Uh, we had n some non-renewals from 22, 23, and 24, as you see, but uh, the non-renewals are down a bit, and that's nice. Um, so congratulations to everyone who's uh, a paid member, and we look forward to that. Um, this is uh, Karen's piece. Uh, Karen, do you want to go down this list real quickly? Um, sure. Just to remind everybody that we do have a Facebook page, um, which is our um, forward facing page the, for the public. Everybody sees that. And then we also have a group, which is for members only. And that's where you can post pictures if you want to get some feedback on something or ask a question or whatever. So we invite you to be active on either one of those. And as Martin also mentioned earlier, Southern Exposure is a lot of stuff in there. We try to spotlight individual members. And um, this month, she's on Zoom with us tonight, but. Um, <clears throat> where our spotlighted member is here with us. We'll leave that as a surprise. You got to go look it up on the, on uh, your Southern exposure. But if you have a nomination for somebody you'd like for us to spotlight that you'd know, like to know a little bit more about, well, let me know. Um, we are doing, Terry Troxell, our webmaster, is doing a category critique each month to give you an idea of what sort of things we're looking for in our animals category. You know, what did win an award last year in architecture? Um, so we're giving you all those pictures again so that you can see them as a group and see what took honorable mention versus first place, et cetera. And then one special article this month, uh, we repeated from last month because our doors and windows assigned subject is coming up. Dan Maurer has a 
an um, article in there talking about his upcoming show on doors, walls, and windows. So if you get a chance, it's at the Richmond Public Library, you know, pop in to see Dan's show that's coming up soon and uh, and get ready to take some pictures of doors and windows. Right, great, thank you. Um, uh, Pat, any comments on uh, what I've listed here, the assigned subject, uh, uh, remember the one image in the assigned subject and you can put two images but only one in the assigned subject category. This is pretty self-explanatory. Um, the exhibits, we've sort of been over this a little bit, best of 2023. Um, if anyone wants to become the exhibit director, Dan has expressed an interest to step down uh, in 2025. But uh, if you have an interest in doing that, please make it known and we'd love to hear from you. Um, there was one announcement about the eclipse. Do you want to say a quick note So uh, Eclipse is rapidly coming upon us on April 8th. Uh, the interesting thing about that is the next total eclipse or annual eclipse is in 2044, 46. So I don't know how many of you guys plan to be around. I'm not sure I will. So if you want to see this, you got to get out there now. And if you want to see... The eclipse, 98% is not good enough. You have to get out there for 100%. So and you got there's good programs to uh, see. If you send me an email, I, I uh, watched a very good program, Lesson Mary Anderson, I believe their name was, did a great presentation on, on it. And I can at least give you the web page. I'm not sure you can, you have to register to see the webinar, but there's, some good information even on that web page. Uh, so, and the, you've got to be really careful about uh, what you're using on your camera and for your eyes. Apparently, some of the lens covers that work for your camera, you, you can't look at the sun, you know, through them because they're, they don't apparently take out the UV, even though there's 16.5 stops. Uh, sh they shut the light out, 16 points. Five stops. So some of these covers uh, will not apparently are not good for optical viewfinders, uh, which I kind of find strange. I would have thought optics would would uh, absorb the UV all that glass. But anyway, so uh, it's coming, and there's a lot of the great information in that program, so you can figure out where to go, how long. You know, it's up to four minutes, so it'll be dark. And it really gets dark. I mean, it's nighttime. Great, thank you. Anthony, I think you were, uh, I have one quick announcement as well. Thank you. All right, well, I appreciate you giving me a window to make a few announcements. Uh, so yes, I will be here next month unless you guys heckle me tonight and I don't come back. So prepare your doors and windows. Uh, as some of you may know, I am the vice president for professional photographers of West Virginia also. So I do speak fluently English and West Virginia ease. Uh, <laughs> I would like to invite you guys to uh, consider coming up and seeing us in West Virginia. We have a annual convention that's happening uh, April 5th, 6th, and 7th. And we have a lot of speakers, I think, that would appeal to a lot of your members. Uh, this is selling your work at galleries, uh, sort of finding your artist vision or, is on the docket. We have a uh, attorney to contact us today wants to do a program on copywriting your imagery. So there's a lot of those types of programs that we're having this time. Uh, and a wonderful lady coming from uh, Tennessee, who's a friend of mine, doing some beautiful portrait work as well. Uh, so if any of you are interested in attending that, or if you're a competition junkie, there's a great competition that's happening through printcompetition.com. Uh, just contact me, Anthony Rumley at mac.com is the easiest way. That's my personal email, so it comes straight to me. Uh, send me a message on Facebook, however you want, and more than happy to get you the information for that. But uh, I hope you guys will consider coming up and joining us. It just so happens one of our judges, 
happens to be doing your program tonight. <laughs> so congratulations to that guy too. But anyway, thank you. Great. Thank you, Anthony. You're welcome. Uh, Fred has been uh, a, a local photographer here in town for a long time and has been a judge and been on both sides of the uh, judging screen. Uh, we're very uh, honored to have him uh, speak this evening on speed lights. And I, I always find it that everyone buys a speed light and then you say, will you bring your speed light? And then God, I don't know where that is, which says you don't use it very much. So for those of us who um, bought it and it sits on the shelf more than it should, welcome, Fred. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mike, Mike, Mike. Oh, Paul. Uh, I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're Paul. I got it. All right. Uh, so Karen, how's my volume? Sounding good. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to move back a little bit here. This is an interesting experiment because I'm talking to everybody here and everybody there. And we spent quite a bit of time Sunday. Paul and Leo, thank you both so much. They gave up about three hours on a Sunday afternoon so we could try and make all this technology work. So uh, fingers crossed, gang. Uh, this is the Camera Club in Richmond. I'm in the right place, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just being sure. Yep. Oop. Is it on yet? Nope. Oh, you'd rather look at me anyway. There we go. Hang on. Your screen. And share that. That's right. We discovered that the other day. And now we start the slideshow. And use slideshow. There we go. Uh, thank you. It, it, it's interesting with this projector and the Mac and the different programs we work to get it going. So you have to go through about three steps. And I invariably were forgetting one. So Paul has promised to keep me straight tonight. So... <clears throat> Can speed lights, lights enhance your photography? Okay. How many people have a speed light? Okay, great. How many have a speed light with you? All right, so we've got some stations. Um, this is going to be an opportunity. I'm going to talk for about, I don't know, maybe an hour. And then you're going to have a chance to test out a lot of the stuff I'm showing you. Um, who will be your subjects? So help each other out. But there are also things, I've got stations out here on the wall. Station one is going to be in here. We'll talk about those in a little bit. All right. I want to talk a little bit about learning. Because that's what we're engaged in tonight. That's actually, it's a lifelong thing. Um, we'll talk a little bit about lighting. It's going to be quick. You all know as much about lighting as probably Anthony and I do but with different perspectives. There's the old notion, not everybody knows everything, but every knows something. everybody knows something. So trying to learn from each other about the somethings that we know and then fill in what we don't know has been a part of my career, both when I was an educator and now as a photographer. Learned a lot from that guy sitting back there, and I hope he's learned one or two things from me. It's, it's hard to tell sometimes. Um, briefly, ISO f-stop speed, how do they affect flash? Talk about speed lights, modifiers for speed lights on camera. I've got this hooked up to Capture One. We're going to take some pictures. We're just going to look at them. What does it look like? How do you change it? What should you be thinking about? Uh, then we're also going to do just a little bit off camera. And I have kind of a neat little setup. And I have triggers for every camera that's in this room, unless you have a Leica. I, that one was sort of out of the ballpark. So at, at any rate. So... That's sort of the scope for what I'm going to try and do with you this evening. Um, so all the PowerPoint and all the handouts are at this link if you want to take a picture. I'll wait just a minute. They're in Dropbox, and if for some reason the link doesn't work, send me an email at fred at fredmorton.photo, and I'll send you the link. 
Uh, did the flash help it be clear, Leo? Okay, good. All right. So if you're just taking a picture of it, you'll get a bit.ly on your phone that'll give you the link, okay? And you can transfer that wherever you've got it. But I wanted you to have the whole show, the handouts. I'm, I'm not going to go through everything, but I've got a two-page gear list, suggestions of things to think about, and there's a link to where you can go look to purchase any of those things on there. I don't have any connection with any of the companies. I just wanted to make it easier for you if you were interested. All right. What is the question most asked often by yourself or others if you're in a workshop or a group or if you're just shooting on the street when you see a great image? This is an interactive part. What kind of camera do you use? How'd you make it? What kind of camera do you use? So when you have a great meal, do you ask the cook, what kind of stove do you have? No. All right. What settings? Okay. So... Pretty cool image. It's one of my images. It's one I'm very fond of. You all, some of y'all have seen that before. Um, that was a client image. So what are the settings on your camera and flash? What are the settings on your camera and flash? We ask that all the time. Anthony, when you got that great picture that I saw in your studio, what were your settings? So the implication is if I use the same settings on my camera and flash, I'm going to take the same picture he did, right? How many of you all have asked that question? Oh, come on. How many of you tried to take the settings that someone else used, put them on your camera, and take a picture and it doesn't look the same? Some of us have been in workshops together. I know you've done it. So, all right, talk about that. I propose a thinking shift as we think about great work. And my question would be, why are your settings? You all understand that change. It's understanding the underlying ideas and how the artist was using like to make some changes in the image as opposed to what are the mechanics. It's what's the thinking behind the mechanics. That way we're going to think deeper about images and, and photographic work. It helps us discover FWP, for what purpose? That light was used for what purpose? Yeah, the purpose was to take a great shot, but there was some thinking, or maybe there was some experimenting that went on to get it done. That's how we start to really see how things work. And that's, as you're working tonight, hope you ask each other that question. That was done with one light. It's one of the few times that, that guy walked in. It was a headshot shoot. I had a few minutes, cut everything off, used one light, took it, did some post-processing, and that image has done pretty well. It looks better on the laptop, I don't want to say. Okay? So, if you think about learning, and that's some of what we're going to do tonight, how do we learn for effective performance? There's lots of information out there. Um, do you learn by lecture? You're not going to learn much, but listen to me. You might get some ideas, but are you going to learn a whole lot by doing this? A little bit. You're going to learn a whole lot more by starting to play with some of this stuff. Is it natural talent that makes for the best achievers? Is it hard work? Is it practice? Is it passion? Yes. All of the above. However, the bottom three overcome the top one frequently. Because sometimes people with an awful lot of natural talent don't put in the other stuff. Some of them fortuitously end up great, but not so much. Here's what researchers have found, okay? Passion is critical. If you're just going about learning and going through the steps, you're trying to do stuff, but you don't really care about what you're learning, you're not going to dig yourself in deeper. I'm hoping you're committed to knowing more about light tonight. Practice indeed does make a difference. How often are you practicing shooting or just go out to take shots? How often do you... Take that speed light and try different things. How often do you step out of your self comfort zone? How many of you have lenses sitting at home that you haven't used for a year? So challenge yourself to take the lens that you've used least often and go out and shoot it for three hours and see what happens. And it's going to be a struggle. You're not going to be happy. 
but then you may achieve some things and begin to see things a different way. And that's still dealing with light. It's the camera and the lens and figuring out light. But lenses give you different focal distance, different noir, different, different opportunities. When you take that out and go do it, you might work for half an hour and say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I don't like this lens. I never liked this lens. I'm going to take it home and sell it. That's the point where real learning engages. When you reach that point of frustration, take a step back, get a coffee, glass of wine, whatever, and go back and start shooting again. When you step through that period of struggle and difficulty is when really magic things can begin to happen for learners. Now, it's not just any practice. One of the key things that researchers have identified, it's intentional practice that makes a difference. I'm going practice and shoot, shoot, shoot. Oh, sorry, Zoom people. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Or, all right, I want to see what this 50 millimeter is going to do. Martin, I'm going to, I'm going to try it here. Okay. You know what? I think I'm going to try it. Oh, oh my gosh, look at that profile. I could take that one to the It's getting in different positions. Do you get down on the ground? Do you get up high? You turn the camera upside down. How many of you turn the camera upside down to shoot it? Try it sometime and see what happens. I'm not going to tell you. That's part of the deliberate practice. So this evening, on a very small scale, we're going to try a little bit of deliberate practice. All right, first, let's talk a little bit about light, speed light, all right? There's natural light. Is there natural light in this room? I'll be back soon. Yeah. If you cut off all the lights, could this possibly be an interesting picture depending on what the settings of your camera were? With a better subject. <laughs> <laughs> or use the Nikon D4S at 6400, you know. So you need enough light. So sometimes... Clearly, looking at that, you want to do something to add some light. All right. Flash is a type of light. Reflected light. When we were working on Sunday and the sun was hitting that pavement outside, all the lights were off in this room and it was like they were all on. It's just that brick wall looks dark right now, but it's pretty light in between that. So looking for reflected light, you can do that without a flash and get some really interesting pictures. I remember a workshop I did with Anthony a long time ago. It was that wedding one we did down at Tredegar. And one of the things, I think it was your stations, it wasn't just about flash, but it was looking about the reflected light and the surfaces there, and it, it was pretty hot. So you get an open shade and begin to use reflected light, and you can get some very different things. Okay, so how do we control light in action? The big three things, right? So f-stop controls. The, I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, right? Opening and closing of the lens. The smaller the f number, the larger the open. One four, you know, whatever. The difference with f-stops can create. Distance, perspective, soft bokeh. So again, if you're being intentional about your practice with that 50 millimeter that you haven't used, what f-stop are you going to use to begin to achieve some different looks? Create a little journal. Write, write down the f-stops. Take that. that. That's intentional practice. Maybe you skip two f-stops and you just go 2.8, 5.6, 8, 11, whatever. And also creates depth of field. Everybody understands those things. And th this group is very connected with that. All right, shutter speed controls the length of time. It hits the camera sensor. Note, remember, it controls ambient light. Shutter speed, for the most part, doesn't control flash, right? Everybody knows that? So if you're taking something and it's too dark and you try and really lower your shutter speed, You'll get a little bit more light in there, but it's controlling that flash. Okay, shutter speed will stop action or blur action. ISO controls how much responsiveness 
in the camera that sensor is to light. Low ISO, less light allowed to hit, but less noise. Slower shutter speed. Higher ISO, more noise, but faster shutter. You're playing with those things all the time. I was talking to somebody before class started. Um, when you put a flash on your camera, how many of you all are using TTL? Okay. And how many of you cut TTL off and use manual? Good. Good. There's a reason to do both. And what's really cool, um, the newest Godox V1, and I'm in the process of shifting from my Nikon Speedlight to Godox. I just love the whole system. Uh, this one in the Pro Photos do it. It's got a little setting. You shoot TTL, you push a button, it takes those settings, it leaves it in, you go back to manual, and you can adjust from there. That's pretty cool. That's a really big thing. Okay. Zoom, folks. That's you seen that, Paul? Oh, Oop. they don't see that. Hmm. They can see you. No. Okay. Yeah. The projector went to sleep, Leo. Wake up. All right. So you all in Zoom can see the slideshow. What we're doing is figuring out what's going on because they can't see it in the room. And there we're back. Okay. I love technology when it works. Okay. So again, there's no one right answer for any of these things. And it's complex. And so if you're being intentional about your practice, change one thing at a time with that 50 millimeter lens that you haven't shot and see what the differences are. Okay, for the purpose of night, on-camera flash. Simple to carry, right? It's little. Um, I don't have one of my big honking things here. The next step up that's really, uh, and I'll encourage you to think about, is the Flashpoint Godox 8200s. Got one, Anthony, about three times the power of a speed light. Not that much bigger, right? It doesn't fit on the camera, but I'll show you a couple of things tonight that are really cool with it. <clears throat> However, if you're traveling, you're knocking around, you're walking around a lot trying to do stuff, this makes a really big difference. The I'm cutting everything on me. Okay, so it adds light. If that's off, yeah, you know, let me go through this and then I'll come back and do that. However, when it's on camera and you do this, what do you get? Get red eyed, really, it's, it's not very attractive. We'll talk about some ways to deal with that on camera. So, one very simple way is like that. Another way is like that. By the way, if I do that and the wall behind me is green, what happens? You, you get broader light, but you're going to get green. So, you want to be careful. This isn't green, so it might be okay. Or you might bounce it to the side. So there are a lot of built-in tools to the on-flash camera that really help you when you do the work. So how big a modifier can you use with the speed light? 12 inch, that's about as far as it can go, right? That's a seven foot umbrella. And I've used both the Nikon and the Godox with that seven foot umbrella. And I was amazed. I saw that shot and said, nah, that, you know, that's Westcott just trying to sell their umbrella. It really works. Now, 
how far you crank the power up. There are lots of things you need to do with it. So the answer is, you may not have to buy the, all the studio lights that Anthony and I use, use as part of our businesses. And Joe McNally has made a lifetime. Of course, Joe McNally, when he goes out to shoot, he talks about shooting speed lights. Have you ever seen one of Joe's carry cases? It's got like 15 speed lights in there, but okay. <laughs> but he'll set them all over the place. They are radio length. I'm going to talk a little bit about why I'm shifting away from the Nikon family. Uh, well, I'll talk about it right now. Um, on the Nikon flash, if this is not radio, what is it? Right, it's infrared. What are the constrictions with infrared? Yeah. And if you don't have it lined up just right, and I've tried to do multiple shots, and it just... So I, I'm making the shift because I love the whole intelligent system behind the ability to use a wireless trigger. So all you need to do is buy one little trigger, and you can take it off camera. You can still do that with your Nikon or Canon or Sony lenses with a little small trigger that it attaches to. Okay, we're not going to shoot the seven foot umbrella tonight. We're going to start out thinking about speed lights. All right, speed light modifiers. Built in your speed light is what? And actually, when I pull it out on the Nikon, you hear it go. So that lens, what, what is the effect of that lens? I'm pointing at the little fuzzy lens that's on top of the speed light for the zoom book. What does that do? Spread, spreads the light out. Okay. So even if I'm shooting directly like that and it spreads out, now that little white card, you can put that back in and that's not direct light, but it it's a little bit bigger light. It's still going to be a little bit sharp. So the other thing, thank goodness it's plastic. Do you all have the plastic cap that came with your flash? How many of you shot with it on there? Not as many as before. It's something to try. If you got it with you tonight, you should try it. The Several manufacturers are making them now. Uh, again, this is the Godox V1, and that's a pretty big difference on top of that than that, right? All right. So here's some other modifiers. Um, <laughs> where's the sock? Okay. So th these are all in the gear list. Okay. One of my favorites and it's made by a company called Dimby. It's called the Flip It. See the difference? That's huge. Oh, wait a minute. I can even slide it around to the side. Unfortunately, they went out of business. They were around for a long time. Great company. You might be able to find that on eBay. Okay. Um, I'm not wild about it, but I included it. Westcott sells it. This is a softbox. And I won't put these on the camera and shoot in a minute, but I want Zoom folks to kind of see what we're doing. So, you know, that's bigger light, right? So it changes it. This thing works putting little Velcro things on your flash, and I, I just find it to be a bit difficult. On the gear list, I've got some other recommendations. Um, this is going to be a giveaway tonight. This goes on. The Velcro's on there, and you shoot through that. That's kind of pr pretty crazy light, isn't it? Okay. More practical, though, 
And Joe McNally's not making this anymore, but I put a link there to some other ones that are on there. Check that out. That's pretty amazing. You can crank it on. Wait a minute. I think the light's too bright. Okay. I got a scrim I can put on top of it. Well, wait a minute. I want to control the light a little bit more. I've got a grid that I can put on top of the scrim or on top of that. That's a really cool system. And the link that I put on the gear list uh, gives you some options. Uh, and again, I think you can find some of these. How much power are you going to put through the speed light? How close are you to the subject? How far away are you to the subject? So, I mean, yeah, yeah, obviously it's going to limit it. I probably wouldn't, well, if I was taking a picture of Joe, I, I probably, but if I really wanted it to turn out, I, you know, I probably would want to use something different. Um, yes. Um, pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. What was the statement? Oh, yes. You have to be careful about impeding your infrared. Why, Anthony? Yes. And why is that important? Don't I just need the infrared if I'm trying to communicate with other speed lights? That's what operates it. Which is why the wireless system with the Godox is really a big step up. And again, Profoto has them. I just I find the Flashpoint Godox, you know, for about a third of the cost, you can get some pretty good light. Um, for wildlife folks, there are a number of these things. That, does anybody use a flash when you're shooting wildlife? Why, Howard? Harold? So I had not, when I was shooting birds, done it. And I went to North Carolina to really a neat place. And I lost the guy's name. He ran weekend workshops down there. He built, had acres of land and had all this natural stuff. And we had little hides that were around there. Speed light on top with a magnifier that goes in there. It creates a beautiful catch light in the bird's eyes. Doesn't take a lot. Um, this one is pretty cumbersome. Uh, Godox has... Um, I won't go into that system in a minute. Uh, two other systems that I've got, and again, you all are going to be able to play with this. There's a whole rogue system where they have things that you can put on your flash. They fold and bend. Uh, I don't have those, but what I do have, which is really kind of cool, because I like the circular look, this, thank you, Paul, this straps around on your flash, doesn't block the infrared, you have a grid then that goes in it. Not very expensive. You can have a, another grid that's a smaller grid. So two different grids that come with it. Same kit. Have any of you gelled your speed lights? Why would you gel? Why would you gel them? Custom lighting. Sure, just like you would gel anything else. Maybe you're the you need to use a CTO. This simple little system is a rubber band that goes on top of the speed light. Right? Very, very cool. Is this going on and off or am I good? Okay. So again, try these out tonight. All right. Um Trying to see where I am. Oh, yeah. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Um, I'm not a big Gary Fong fan. I found that his dome uh, didn't hold up over time. A lot of people like the dome. Uh, his dome kind of looks 
something like this, what does that do when you put a dome on a speed light? That's big light, soft light, much better. What happens if you really want to create an interesting look? Try this one tonight. It's very, very cool. Um, all right. I think I'm going to go to the next step here. All right. I want to just talk quickly. I'm not here to sell MagMod, but I like the system. You can start out with a very simple little kit. This goes on the speed light. Does it get in the way of the infrared? No. And then, and I've got uh, four of these. So when we get to a station and you're breaking into different groups, uh, just know a couple of these are new. So you you put it good on that one. Put it on the speed light like that, and then you pull it over, you slide them down. And you want to be sure that you get it down right there. These magnets are pretty strong. And at the station, and by the way, this kind of comes like that. And in that kit is a magnet, a dome, and a scoop. In that kit is a dome, a magnet, and a scoop. We're going to try those in a minute. Integrated within the system. A snoot. Uh, okay, I didn't put the snoot in there. I don't know what happened. All right. Same thing. Try this tonight. What's the difference if I put the snoot on and just shoot it like that? I'm not going to answer the question. It's it's kind of rhetorical. All right. We'll try it and see. Joe, go ahead. Yeah. Well, but aren't I doing it that way? Yeah. So what's the difference? Maybe nothing, maybe something. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'm trying to keep you in mind, Zoom folks. All right, very quickly, we're not going to spend much time with this because I really want to show you a couple of things and then get you doing some test shooting. How many of you shot flash off of your camera? Oh, good number. And what are you using to do that? Trigger, okay. Joe? Joe got also fired a Sony flash, fired an icon flash, fired a Canon flash. Let me repeat that. Yeah, so go, go ahead and say it again. If you have the Godox V1 unit and you have multiple cameras, all you need is trigger for your camera, it'll fire all those flashes. So you don't need, if you have an icon and an icon Godox and you buy a Sony, you don't need a Sony trigger, just use, just get the Sony flash. The trigger will fire all of them. Which is why, actually, that V1 came in this weekend. I won't say I just got it for the class so I can look like I got a V1. I really got it because I like the round light. We'll do some things that I've forced on my other ones. Um, all right. Moving flash off camera, a couple of ways. Either a sync cord or a cable. Anthony, I bet you've got a ton of these floating around. Okay. So this is the Nikon cord. They're there for Canon. I'm assuming they're there for the other ones. Okay. On camera, flash goes on this. If you got a little tripod, you're doing this, you take it off and you can hold it here, right? So you can do it without a trigger. And this this actually cable works just fine. But I want to be able to be mobile. Um, this is probably more pricey. Um, this is really my go-to when I'm doing events, though. 
this is really, really powerful. So, camera on here. Up. Oh. All right. Camera on here. And again, flash hooks to the camera. You can carry it around. What's really nice, I want to go the other way. Do you have one of these? Yeah. Hey, it's invaluable uh, in the event work that I do. So this is a couple hundred bucks. It's on the, it's a pro media gear. It's on the gear list, but it, it really can enhance what you're doing. If you're doing street photography, it might be a bit much walking out with that thing. But on the other hand, maybe not. Now, the other thing, which I like the Godox system, as I've said, camera goes on the back. It. <laughs> this trigger goes on the camera. Flash goes up here. It's more stable. Um, for a lot of what I'm doing now, the other step I take, and maybe more than what you want to do, is basically, and this is on the list, that goes on top of that bracket. That's a Godot flash head that comes around to a little thing you're carrying on your side. And all of a sudden, I have 200 watts of power on that bracket. I use it a lot. Okay, And you can use the, the different Godox flash point magnifiers. So I'm not going to work with that tonight, but I want you to see the options go from a little to a lot to change your lighting game. And depending on what you're doing, you, you don't have to be a professional. That, that stuff can make a huge difference. All right. Next step off camera. And there's sort of the system. Uh, like I said, I'm using now. Uh, you can do it with the Nikon system too. Uh, which basically... These are an earlier version of the trigger. This would go on your camera. The flash goes on this. So you actually could put this on your camera. And if you're really strong and it's one of the lighter weight cameras, you can hold it and you can be holding the flash right up here and firing. Wireless, not infrared. Yes. Uh, the question was, is it TTL? Yes. TTL and high speed sync. That most of my shooting is in events, and I, I don't need high speed sync in the crazy lighting that's in hotels and conference centers. All right, I'm going to show you a couple of other things. Sure. Yep. I had issues with Pocket Wizard, which is actually what sort of drove me into the line I'm working now. I've got a bunch of Pocket Wizard stuff if anybody's interested. <laughs> so the, the question was magnetic interference when you're firing, not with these triggers, no. And Andy, what, what did I, what? Back to your Pocket Wizard, some people are familiar with the Apple has the transmitter and the receiver on the unit and the setting is built into the Right. Not a separate component for your flash unit or built in to go to the system. Yeah. So it, it, the, the combination of the units the, and the technology is getting better. And if you look at the prices, the Nikon Canon flash, well, the Canon's less than Nikon. The Nikon flash is $499. And it's 72 watts if you, you know, people that do watts and looking at it. 
Uh, the V1, I think, was 199. Let's see, half the price, more control, more flexibility. All right, so this is a speed box diffuser. Folds up really simple in a little case. I'm going to leave it set up. Now, the key is for this, you need a trigger, okay? However, goes in the back of that. It's lightweight. Now, by the way, I did not have the speed light in it when I did that. <laughs> in case anybody was working. So, pass it around, fill the weight of that. Again, I can be holding the camera, if it's a lighter weight camera, and doing this. And, uh, by the way, that is on a MagMod handle that just screwed into the bottom of that. So, that's a whole lot easier to hold than just trying to hold the bottom of that. MagMod handle on that. So, while I'm talking about some other things, just pass around and get a feel of that, because that is pretty lightweight. Uh, the other system, again, this is, I think, 99 bucks. Goes like that. I forgot my F-stopper, didn't I? We're going the other way. Again, this is a lightweight system that folds out. It goes in there. It goes in that real small carry case. Portable, can travel all over the world. This slips inside the brackets there. Okay. And I think for $99 at uh, Richmond uh, Pro in uh, Carrytown. Okay. Again, that fits in there. And again, you'll need a trigger to work with that. The one thing that I forgot to show you, and they don't make these anymore, but this is really a handy dandy little tool. It used to be made by F-stoppers. See, there's a gray card there. But what's really interesting is you take this, How's that change the light? Pretty cool, I think. Uh, there's similar things, and I, I put links in. I'm going to leave that out uh, in the gear list. All right. I'm not going to take time to talk about the AD200 right now because, uh, well, the AD200 right now for the full kit, 349. The Nikon is 596. Uh, you get a whole bunch of stuff with a kit. If you want to take a step beyond your speed light, but don't take that step until you play with your speed light some. Or, 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 those camera folks like gear, right? Don't jump to the gear before you work with it. All right. So some added tools for the speed light. Again, you'll use these. This goes on. Again, this is the MagMod system. That can screw into the bottom the AD200, but you don't need to do that. You can get this little setup from MagMod. That magnet goes on a speed light. Speed light locks in there. You can have one or two speed lights. Again, you need a trigger, but these triggers are $69. So you get one speed light, you get a trigger, you just get this little setup with a magnet, and you can do all of this. Now, what's really interesting, <clears throat> it's a really cool system. It's still not very heavy. It's heavy if you put an 80, you can put two 80 200s on there. That's, it's just too heavy. The two speed lights, not bad. And what's really cool about this system, if you have any of these, how often do you lose that? It just stays right in the little pocket there. So 
we'll have I'll have a couple of lights and triggers, and you all are going to be able to muck around with it. I'll move things out in the hallway in a minute, and I want you to just try things out. Um, I'm going to show a couple of things. Okay. 